In this lecture, we're going to introduce Ruby as a, as a programming language. Uh, we'll move on to Rails next lecture, but here I just want to give the very basics of Ruby, not from the point of view of teaching you how to program, I'm assuming you, you, you're familiar with that, but to talk a little about how Ruby as a language differs from some of the other, other languages you might be used to. Um, so we're going to look at the basics of Ruby syntax, and once we've done the very basics of that, then we'll move on to introducing classes in Ruby. Uh, there's some small differences from other classic programming languages in in Ruby in the basic syntax. The the biggest difference really is in the power of its object orientation, because as we'll see later, everything in Ruby is an object. So in contrast to Java and C++, there are no primitive types. There are just objects. So in an integer is an object. Um, a string is an object. So that means that there's things you can do in order to manipulate objects straight away. Uh, so let's go into that. The material on these lectures are in this lecture and the next lecture is, for deliberate re reasons, taken from what's often referred to as the pickaxe book because of the picture on its cover. Uh, that's um, Dave Thomas's book on, on programming Ruby. Uh, you'll see the same examples used and so you can use that book as a, as a reference if you want to go back and explore any of the things that are covered in this lecture in a little bit more detail. It's all there. Start taking a look at arrays and hashes as 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 the first thing. Very simple things I'm not really going to cover, but let's take a, a look at arrays and hashes. Um, simple declaration here, very familiar if you're a, a Java programmer. Um, it's an untyped array, so you can put into it any any objects that you would like. We've got here. Uh, an integer, a string, and a real number. And if we now, at the command prompt in the uh, um, in a Ruby console, we type put, uh, then the first element is, and then the hash indicates that the evaluation of the expression immediately following will be inserted into that string. Uh, a useful, very succinct statement to to embed an evaluated uh, um, uh, operation into into a string. Then we will get from that uh, the the output um, uh, that you might expect. The the first element is uh, one in this particular case. <coughs> Now, if we just set the third element, again, very straightforward, uh, we can um, uh, assign a new value to it. In this particular case, we've set the third element to nil. Again, familiar, just to, just to, to, to uh, point it out, familiar as with other programming languages, uh, the index of an array starts from zero, so the third element, the index for that is actually two, and then we get um, uh, um, the value nil assigned to uh, the, the, the third element, or at least the third element more strictly points to the object which is represented by nil. Um, so again, uh, going back to what I said a few moments ago, everything is an object, nil is an object, it represents nothing. But there are things you can do with nil, and you can use nil in a Boolean expression, for example, again, as we'll see later, and this is quite a powerful feature, because nil uh, is treated in Ruby as false if it's present in a Boolean expression. So you can, as an aside, succinctly test if uh, 
an object is uninstantiated. It's uninstantiated. It'll be pointed. It'll be represented by the nil object um, without anything going horribly wrong. So some very simple operations there, but as you uh, as you see, one or two key differences um, in with some of the uh, some other programming languages beginning to emerge. Um, as arrays are sometimes used in order to collect together words, then there's a very simple way in Ruby in order to construct uh, an array of words. We use this um, uh, percent %w with curly brackets and then list all the words that need to be concatenated together into a list of words. Um, uh, the, the internal representation is exactly the same. It's uh, represented what will be represented, what A will be pointing to in this particular case is a string of words, quite simple. Hashes are used quite extensively in in Ruby and we will see as we explore Rails in more detail that hashes are a very important data structure in Rails, an incredibly useful data structure. So uh, let's introduce those next with a toy example. Um, just a, a, a list of key value pairs separated with the equals and greater than sign <coughs> to indicate an arrow. Um, so in this particular case, uh, cello ma maps to string, clarinet to woodwind, and so forth. You, as a programmer, need to make sure that the uh, the index values are unique in a in a hash. Um, so you will get an error if you have repeated index in the hash. So that's an obligation on you as a programmer. Um, Accessing it is exactly the same way in which you would access an array. You index on the the, the, the values of the keys. Um, so, very strong similarities between arrays and hashes as structures. Essentially, in hash, it's like an array, but you I did you declare the the. Um, the values of the indexes yourself, and you've got that under control yourself. But of course, with the obligation on you as a programmer to make sure that the index set are um, don't have does not have any repeated values in it. Uh, the next thing, which which is a little bit. Uh, a little bit different to what you might be expecting, and this is uh, a, t a typical gotcha in a, an exam question, so it is important to remember this, and it is, again, a useful thing to keep Ruby as a, a robust language. So if you try to access a key as uh, access a hash with a key that's not defined and we'll see the same thing happening with an array if we access out of the existing uh, access with a uh, an index which is out of the existing size of the array we get a very different behavior in Ruby to to what you're used to seeing uh, whoops let's go uh, so you get a very different behavior to what you what you what you expect uh, from another programming language. It's worth trying it. Um, perhaps take a break from from watching this. Try it out on a console of your own and see what happens. It's a little bit surprising because you don't get an error message if you try to access a um, a value that hasn't gotten a key so associated with it or access with a key that has not been used within that uh, that hash, you'll get back a nil if you try to access it. It's simply telling you there isn't an object, there is a nil object assigned to that um, that index. Uh, you get the same response if you try to access an element out of the existing bounds of an ar array. 
you'll get an ill object back, you won't get an error. That's quite useful because you can then use that as a, as a check um, and control, use a, a control statement to, to, to handle that uh, situation. Um, we'll see some other interesting things uh, in those a little bit later. So talking about uh, control structures, let's move on to those now. And same sort of control structures as you'd be expecting to, to see in any programming language. We've got a, an if statement here, uh, a while statement. Uh, the use of curly brackets is not there. What we have are the the boundaries of the control structure identified by if at the beginning and end, similarly in a while statement, while and the block that's being executed while the condition is satisfied, and then an end to terminate the, the, the while statement. Um, the use of end is widely used in Ruby, and we don't normally see curly brackets to delineate uh, a structure. Um, don't really need to talk through these in, a, in any detail, as I say, the, the, the use of if, else and end should be quite clear from these examples. We've got an else if in the middle there, so uh, if you're looping through different conditions then use el else if and then there's a final else for the, the catch-all at the end. <coughs> I've said a little bit about this already, so within a control structure we can use statements as, as conditions and this use of nil in many situations is an important, uh, is an important part of that because what happens now in, instead of if something is not found or is not instantiated um, a failure arising, we can use, for example, a call to an array and have an out of bounds value return nil, which will be treated as false, and that condition will then be ex handled quite cleanly within the control structure. Uh, a particular example of that is with this this small example here, where we are getting repeated strings from a file and instantiated line and printing them out in, in lowercase at the command line prompt. Um, again, this is an exam gotcha. It's something which many people give the wrong answer when they see something like that. The question is, what happens when you reach the end of the file with something like that? If you're programming this in, in Java, Java or, or C++, you would need some particular check before you uh, call that um, uh, that statement which instantiates line with a, a string from a file. Uh, you'd need to do an end of file check before you do that to avoid a failure. We've actually embedded the end of file check in here because as soon as gets returns nil, that is, it's reached the end of the file and it's returned an empty, a nil object, then line will be instantiated to nil and that statement then evaluates to false and the statement state and the, the, the program will terminate cleanly. So we've got a nice succinct expression, very clean declarative statement of what we want without having to put any extra control structure and tests in there. Uh, it doesn't need to do any additional checks. As soon as it gets to the end of the file, gets will return